Welcome everybody, where you are in Europe or maybe uh, on another continent. Very welcome to this fourth edition of the Green Post Corona Talks of the Green European Foundation. I'm Dirk Holemans, co president of the foundation, director of Oikos Green Think Tank in Belgium, and host of these talks. Today, we will talk about food security and food sovereignty in times of Corona. And as you all have followed the news, we know that our food system is quite in trouble. We have on the one hand, poor people not able to get to food. The people waiting, the waiting lines for food, people at food banks are getting longer. On the other hand, we have farmers that uh, are not able to harvest what's on their fields. Because for instance, like in Belgium, the potatoes are meant to uh, export to Russia or also the meat. So it seems that the food system is really uh, in trouble. For discussing this, we have three very inspiring speakers. First, we will give the floor to Olivier de Schutter. He is one of the members of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems and also former UN Rapporteur on the Right to Food. After him, we will give the floor to Stanka Becheva. She is a food and agriculture campaigner at Friends of the Earth Europe. And then we move to the political perspective with Tilly Metz. She is an MEP for the Greens Eva from Luxembourg and member of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety. First, all of three speakers will give a contribution of max 10 minutes. And then we will have an interaction. For people who are watching this, you can put all your questions on uh, Facebook, or you can also connect with Twitter to the Green European Foundation. I can see your questions on my computer screen. And so in the second part of this session, we will have a Q&A with the three persons answering your questions. First, uh, as I said, I want to give the floor to uh, Olivier de Schutter. Okay, well, good afternoon to all and many thanks to Paul for introducing this, uh, this presentation uh, with these four voices um, um, to, to discuss the future of food systems in the post-COVID world. I'd like to start by um, simply drawing our attention to the fact that this crisis shows how our food systems are in fact fragile despite the impression that they create that they are robust. Uh, today we have, in fact, a, a very solid um, uh, production from the past harvest. The, the global food reserves are at their highest. 275 million tons of food are, are ready uh, to, be, uh, to be used and, and, and distributed. But the food systems are nevertheless under threat for three reasons. First of all, we have a number of countries who have announced certain export restrictions, Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan for wheat, Vietnam for rice, for example, in total a dozen countries have done so. It is not yet impacting the prices, but should such export restrictions um, develop um, at a larger scale, it may put pressure on markets and create some, um, some panic on the markets as we had seen in 2008. So that is one, one first source of concern. When we have whole regions, countries that depend on imports to satisfy their needs, when these regions, countries produce very little of what they consume and produce essentially in order to export, we, we may um, um, be at risk of supply chains being cut as a result of restrictions to export. So indeed, ports, for example, not being able to function well. So that's the first concern. A second concern is that um, as schools have closed in many countries, as um, restaurants, cafes are not functioning anymore, quite a few producers, particularly small scale producers who depend on these outlets to sell their production, find themselves unable um, to, um, to access markets. And indeed, some producers who do produce for export uh, face uh, um, a break in supply chains, and Dirk Holemans mentioned the case of potato production in Belgium, for example, and are in, unable, again, to, uh, to sell 
the, the stocks that they have accumulated. And so what we will see in the next few weeks uh, are important food losses resulting from the breakdown of supply chains, resulting from the lockdowns um, of certain uh, regions with the schools and, and restaurants shut down in particular. This is why, for example, in Belgium, in France, ministers have called for farmers to be allowed to privately conserve their meat um, um, reserves or their dairy products in order to avoid everything uh, going to waste. A third challenge, which is probably in the next few weeks going to be the most important, has to do with the, the travel of seasonal migrant workers that we need in order to, to harvest uh, production in the next uh, few weeks and, and months. Um, the UK, for example, requires 60,000 seasonal farm workers. It's 150,000 in the countries such as um, the Netherlands or, or in Spain. It is in, in Germany 300,000 people that are, that are needed. And most of this workforce comes in Europe from Bulgaria, from Romania, sometimes from Poland. Poland itself imports seasonal workers from Ukraine. And this um, um, seasonal migration of farm workers is now made impossible as a result of the restrictions on, on travel. And so this explains why, for example, Didier Guillaume, the French Minister of Agriculture, has called upon volunteers to, to lend a hand to, to the farmers in, in France, um, those who are under temporary unemployment. Students, for example, have been um, uh, asked to support farmers to harvest their, their crops, and some 200,000 people have responded to this call. So it is a very um, uh, striking um, uh, break in the way the food systems um, normally work that this temporary seasonal migration of farm workers has been interrupted. So for me, the, the provisional lesson to be drawn is very simple. Our food systems have been shaped in order to maximize efficiency. And efficiency means specialization of regions into certain types of production, a limited range of foods are produced by each region, each country. This allows economies of scale uh, by the development of large monocropping schemes that are easy to mechanize. And it allows a division of international labor, if you wish, that is meant to um, stimulate um, efficient production. But that search for efficiency has now um, become a source of fragility. And we need to invest in different food systems, in shorter food chains, in localized food systems uh, that are much more resilient. And resilience means diversity. It means producing more of what you consume. It means producing a diversity of foods in order to be less dependent on imports. And it means types of production that can be less affected by sanitary crisis, by climate crisis, environmental crisis, or by economic crisis. In a system such as the one we inherit from, in which each region depends on many others to uh, satisfy the needs of the population, any break in global supply chains can uh, create havoc on the markets, can lead to price increases uh, that can be troubling, particularly in times of economic recession for low-income families, and it is exactly that scenario that we must try to avoid. I close with the last sentence, which is that today governments have become aware of these pressures on the food systems, and they're trying to improvise short-term solutions to allow the system to function better. For example, Germany has allowed farm workers to travel from Romania and Bulgaria in order to uh, ensure that the harvest will be able to, to take place in, in good conditions. But these short-term measures to revamp the existing system should not delay action on the long-term um, measures we need, we need to adopt to move to more sustainable, more resilient, and indeed more local food systems. And that was the whole philosophy behind the proposals of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, IPES Food, developed together with a large number of organizations in Europe, including, including Friends of the Earth Europe, um, for a food policy for the EU, a food policy that would um, um, 
that would be uh, the objective of a multi-year transition plan that should be organized at European level and that should gradually allow us to move away from this efficient but fragile um, food system we inherit from to something that is much more resilient. So I will stop there and I look forward to our discussion with many thanks for you all uh, for joining. Okay, uh, Olivier, thank you for this introduction. Maybe already a uh, first question because it's a kind of question uh, you read a lot. Uh, let's say the defenders of agro-business, they are telling uh, or defending themselves with the argument that if you move to more small scale and low production, you will, that will be less efficient and so there will be much less production of foods. So what's your answer to this? You know, I, I think there is a, a huge confusion around this issue. Um, um, small scale farms, um, smaller size farms, are usually highly efficient in the way they use the surface of land that they have under cultivation and indeed the resources, um, land, water at their disposal. However, these small farms are more labor intensive. They create employment, which many people would say is a very good thing, particularly in times of, of mass unemployment. Um, however, it means that these small farms are less competitive on global markets in which all farmers compete with one another, at least um, uh, within the internal market in the EU, but even more broadly in, um, in the global markets. So these small farms are highly efficient in the use they make of resources. They are very productive per hectare. However, they are less competitive because they, are more, um, um, uh, they demand more labor per output, right? So the labor productivity is worse on these small farms. And indeed, large monocropping schemes can very easily substitute women and men with machines in order to develop large uh, large scale production but for a number of reasons which are agronomic the need to have soil health preserved by diversified farming systems for reasons that are um, related to the quality of nutrition we need a diversity of foods produced um, uh, in order to to feed the community with uh, uh, adequate diets and for reasons that have to do with the development of the rural economy it is much better to have smaller size farms that are more labor intensive and are much um, better at managing the natural resources. The problem is, yes, this has price implications. And so um, until we move away from the paradigm of the low cost food economy, in which we artificially repress the price of food uh, for, the, for the families, and until we take seriously the, the, the need to, um, to provide support to the farmers who provide ecosystem services, preserve agrobiodiversity, preserve uh, soil health and, and manage the ecosystems adequately. Um, until we dare have this discussion, it will be indeed very difficult to make a transition. And big agribusiness companies, the big players in, in the food systems who bet on economies of scale and on logistics in global supply chains, they will all, always have a strong argument to delay action towards such a transition. Okay, thanks for this uh, important uh, reaction, which made clear that uh, small-scale farmers are in a way much more productive and much more taking care of the soil and the environment. I now want to give uh, the floor to Stanka Becheva, campaigner at Friends of the Earth Europe, who, of course, uh, from an NGO perspective, is also looking at the crisis of the current food system and also I would say has a critical look on how the European Commission is dealing with this issue. So, Stanka, please, uh, I'm curious to hear your contribution. Hi, everyone, also from my side. I hope you are sitting comfortably on your sofa or uh, kitchen table or wherever you are. Um, the last two months, I think, have been very, very dynamic and challenging for many of us in different ways. For some of us less for others more. And I think um, been really a lot more now visible is uh, 
the, the, the current food system and the, the challenges that it has, as it's been uh, mentioned already, already by um, Olivier. Um, just to say, Friends of the Earth, it's an um, environmental and social justice environmental uh, grassroots network. We have members in 30 European countries, and one of the issues we're working on is food and farming. So yes, definitely, we've been observing and, and looking at the, this very fast development in the, in the last um, of the last two months. Um, Olivia said already a lot of what I wanted to say. I was going to just add maybe a first part of what uh, I was going to talk about is the analysis, which was done more or less. The second one, what has been the response? And the third one is what is our response as Friends of the Earth? Um, since Olivia focused on the challenges, maybe I want to say that um, obviously um, there are a lot of challenges, but we're seeing also a lot of positive things happening with that crisis. Um, and I like looking at it from an urban and a rural perspective a little bit because my family, it's a rural family. They're farming at the moment while we here in the cities are uh, sitting and not knowing what to do in the evening and uh, kind of looking for Zoom calls with friends and so on. A lot of um, of the work is happening just now on the fields. So. Um, starting from April until October, this is the really, really busy period of uh, for, for farming. So again, looking at the perspective from urban and rural, we see a lot of us locked down and really a lot of restrictions here on the other side in the in the rural areas on the field. This is now when um, when the work is starting and and having the crisis right now, I think it's uh, increasing a lot, even uh, these problems. Um, I will not go now into the problems which have been mentioned, um, just maybe on the positive sides for us as, um, as urban people. Um, I don't know if you've seen um, a survey from the UK shows that people are now cooking more from scratch. Uh, restaurants are closed. We heard that uh, people cannot go and eat out. Eat out. Um, so 40% uh, of people said they valued food more and around 38% said that they're cooking more often from scratch. So this is, for example, something which uh, I think it's, if it was like really fantastic and we should think about, and I think it, it's making us rethink a little bit the way how we, how we consume. On a positive side, maybe on the rural um, side of things, a lot of the challenges have been mentioned already, uh, farm workers missing, um, the market for certain products, completely kind of uh, crashing and so on. But on the positive side, what we hear from our members and organizations we work with is that um, there is very increased um, interest in community supported agriculture. People want to buy food from consumers direct from the producers directly. We have two of our members who are running facilitating a food uh, farmers map uh, where they can directly the farmers with the consumers. And uh, this has been a huge boom recently. I just read from Greece, from an organization we work with as well, that they started a very kind of a hot campaign with, um, with some citizens to promote uh, the direct contact between uh, farmers and consumers. And this is going apparently also well. So I think we need to think um, and kind of keep in mind that they are all trends which are uh, showing us um, a lot of positiveness. To add to that, maybe a solidarity action I heard of in Romania, where farmers again are exchanging seeds in this difficult situation. Um, and obviously, the situation is very fluid. So it's been two months now, which felt like a whole uh, kind of uh, year, maybe. Right, um, and it will. Be even more. In terms of what been the political reaction, very quickly, um, also just selecting some of the issues. So, what we heard already in March, I think it was the WTO, uh, the FO saying, calling on governments to not uh, restrict trades and, and food supplies. I think that's been one of the first uh, kind of reactions we heard. And G20 of agriculture ministers uh, just some 10 days ago or something actually confirmed that they are not going to do this. Um, what we are um, seeing as well that uh, also Olivia mentioned they've been while general travel restrictions, we saw governments making exemptions on um, on people who are working in uh, in farming to to travel um, by plane and um, 
making sure that this these people who are missing on fields are are kind of filled uh, through this. Um, what we've seen as well, what I've seen in Bulgaria, I don't know um, my country. Um, the government has obliged supermarkets to sell local food, which is something quite uh, quite exceptional. So they didn't introduce uh, uh, a travel restriction or uh, trade restrictions, but they obliged the supermarkets to actually sell the local products to ensure that the uh, the, the products produced in, in the country are staying on the on the market. I, and I'm sure there are a lot of other exemptions in other countries as well. What's happened on the EU level? It's um, several reactions from the European Commission uh, starting already at the end of March and the last one was actually just two days ago when the European Commission has announced a number of measures starting from administrative changes to when payments can be um, can be registered to um, uh, some reduced on spot checks uh, to then 10 days ago to come up with a, 80 million package, uh, which is supposed to be given to European farmers to support certain sectors. And that's again for certain sectors like milk, um, meat sector was mentioned already, wine, uh, olive oil, vegetables. And one other thing, which is not strictly to agriculture, but I think it will also be interesting to, to look at is the upcoming MFF plus, as they call it, basically the recovery package of the European Union uh, kind of reacting to the crisis, uh, which will also give some some directions of, of how the European Union is reacting generally to the economic crisis, but also what's happening in agriculture. At the same time, we know there are uh, several political reforms and policies uh, still um, okay. ongoing. Um. The cap reform, can you hear me well? Uh, maybe to be mentioned. So several of those have been delayed, and we don't know uh, where they will go at the moment. Maybe just uh, last briefly then to say what our response as Friends of the Earth has been. Um, as I said, we've been following those. Um, we'll also react to the. MFF plus and to several other developments, which will be then coming as response from the European Commission. Uh, we think that um, since the crisis, it's a it's a worldwide one. It really needs to um, requires uh, an in solidarity for uh, for the common interest. And our lifestyles have been mentioned. They have created, we think, the perfect. Um, the perfect conditions for this virus to spread and that's why we think that we need to generally rethink our consumption travel patterns we need to rethink the way and, and that really um, think of, of of different ways to actually uh, tackle all these very important lifestyle uh, decisions which have led to a lot of these problems we also think that we need to rethink the whole fragile economic system which Right now, it's 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 showing really the inequalities in different places um, of what's what's been uh, kind of mentioned in. Uh, it's it's an European response specifically to agriculture. Um, Olivier has mentioned already several elements. Um, maybe just to say on the short term. Um, we need to really see reactions to the situation of agricultural workers on the fields because what's happening um, at the moment with their conditions is really um, unacceptable and there needs to be a, a, an immediate um, reaction to health and housing conditions for them. And on a longer term, completely agree with Olivier, we need to think of transitioning the food system and all these policies I just mentioned before need to be really rethought in the way that they can don't they contribute to this uh, to this objective. Um, and to kind of um, maybe close up, I want to say that we um, 
we hope that we can keep up the solidarity, the hope um, and the actions going. And um, as we did in an action for the 17th of April, the International Day of Peasant Struggle, the hashtag was stay home, but not silent. So this is what we're um, trying to do. And uh, that's why contributing to this workshop as well. Okay, many thanks. Uh, staying home, but not silent. I think it's indeed the perfect uh, way of also uh, looking as, at these talks. Um, Tilly Metz, you're a member of the European Parliament. You're a member of the Committee on Env Environment, Public Health and Food Safety. Mm -hmm. You will have been following the policies of the European Commission very closely. So how do you look at them? Are you taking the right measures? Is it going fast enough? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody from Luxembourg. Thanks for inviting me. I'm very glad to be to be among you. Let me first say as an introduction that uh, for the Greens, the whole food system is not only in a crisis since the pandemic COVID-19, but for us, it is clear that the system is insane since a long time ago. But it's true that uh, the pandemic crisis we endure right now makes it even more obvious and shows also the fragility of the EU food security in a sanitary crisis, even if the EU is a net exporter and has a wide variety uh, of soil and climate conditions, we have now serious problems and tensions surrounding the food production because of the disruption of the Schengen area and the introduction of these green lanes did not not really resolve completely or entirely this issue. What we have, why I say it's a crisis already for a long time, now we have these long queues at the borders, we have enormous suffering of animals during transport, we are importing GMO feed from south, and um, so genetically modified organism feed from south and North America, so contributing to deforestation, we have industrial farming with a lot of antibiotics and pesticides, and um, this industrial farming is then also a vector of pathogens and so contributing to zoonosis and the loss of biodiversity. We have an overproduction of meat and dairy and an underproduction of vegetables and fruits in many countries. And we have, and it was already said, also bad treated seasonal workers. And I could go on like this. So the agriculture is at the same time contributing and suffering from pandemics and climate change, which did not disappear during this time, threatening our food production and influencing the spread of pathogens. So let me just start by sharing some points of the green position. The Greens have always been there to say, let's fund farms, not big factories, and let's protect biodiversity. And this still is still true now coming to propose solution for a more sustainable and resilient food system as a reaction of the COVID-19 increase. Let me talk about a few files that are really uh, of, of importance right now. And it was already said in the European Parliament, all eyes are now focused on the Green Deal, which is the European strategy to be the first climate neutral continent and comprises a set of policies, proposals to make the EU economy sustainable and to be climate neutral by 2050. While some conservatives and liberal see this more as a threat to short term, to short term saving, rebuilding the existing economy, including the agri sector, others such as the Greens see this Green Deal as an absolutely necessary piece of legislation more than ever now. One of its objectives is designing a set of deeply transformative policies, which includes food and agriculture. And it was already said, we're speaking about the farm to fork strategy, which is an important part of this Green Deal, and it implies the whole food chain. So its goal is really to protect the environment, to address climate change, to preserve biodiversity, as well as contributing to circular economy and preventing food waste, together with the farmers who are really in the, in the forefront of this agricultural ecological transition. We need more resilient, less resource intensive and less input dependent food system, and therefore we need agroecology, including organic farms. 
The Commission's proposal for the farm to fork strategy should have been presented in the end of March and it got postponed. Now it is postponed, we hope, as Timmerman said, not for months but for weeks and it's now scheduled for the end of May. Leaks are partly promising, I must say. Less pesticide, action plan for organic farming, livestock farming should be reduced, integrated food policy that involves the whole full supply chain, but for our screens, nevertheless, it's a lack overall of ambition. For example, there is no paradigm shift in the common agriculture policy or in the common fishery policy. And it even contains some ruining parts when thinking of that uh, directive on the GMOs of the genetically uh, manipulated organism should be reopened. And let's see how concrete they really will address the problem, the issue of reducing meat consumption. So the CAP, the Common Agriculture um, Policy of the European Union has its origin, and it was already said by Olivier, at a time where food was scarce. And therefore, for me, the, the focus was really on high production output. Today, though, our main concerns are many. And the question is not only how to allow to have a secure food supply for all the Europeans, but also how to make the agriculture sector part of the solution against climate change, against the loss of biodiversity, rather than part of the problem. So at the beginning of 2020, Tinnaman said, and I was quite happy of it, we need a comprehensive assessment of the common agriculture policy versus Green Deal by the Commission. That was good, but now with the COVID crisis, there was no follow-up of this idea. The cut is always for seven years, for 21, normally it should have been from 21 to 27, and it mentioned to be future-oriented more than the, the, the predecessors, and also take environmental concerns into account, especially as it is the farmers that are suffering the most from, for example, droughts brought by climate change. The EU Commission had a proposal in June 2018, which was already of a new common agriculture policy, which was already quite late when you think there were elections in May 2019. So this file has now three uh, sub-files. The big one is the strategic uh, plans regulation, then we have the common market organization, and then we have the horizontal regulation where I'm the reporter for the green in the agri, because I'm also in the agri committee, uh, over there. So I'm mainly working on the horizontal regulation. The Parliament still had time for committee voting uh, in April 2019, where we had quite a good text in the ENVI committee, but was quite lost then in the agri committee, like it is often the, the, the case. Now, after the election, the Commission did not propose a new common agriculture policy because you, you would have thought with 70% of new members of the European Parliament, they also could have said, OK, with all these new members, we need now a, a new proposal. There are partially in the committees, the negotiations are going on in agri, the Agriculture Committee, Environment Committee, they are still ongoing. But um, yes, we have now an angry rapporteur who seems to be less ambitious than the one previous and the plenary vote of the new agricultural, uh, of the new cap, uh, this vote should be probably at the end uh, of 2020 and also then again with uh, quite a lot of amendments. So, and we feel the risk that it's not going in the right change we would like as Greens to do it. So we won't have a new common agriculture policy until the end of 2022. So there, we are now in a two period transition uh, period. And uh, be before I give you an overview of the various COVID-19 reactions, let me just say a few words on the genetically modified organism, because some big industries, they might say this in the after COVID-19 to see this as a solution. Uh, so the genetically modified organisms are there to support high quantities of pesticides, for example, soya beans and mice, and we import them, as I said already, from North and South America to feed to 95% our farmed animals, so it's not for human consumption mostly. Why do I mention that? As I said already, because some people after the COVID-19 
um, a crisis might say uh, this might be a solution, this uh, genetically modified uh, organism. But instead of genetic modification and monocultures, we need genetic diversity. And we finally need to, pro to progress on a protein plan for Europe, including a local protein uh, plan also for human consumption. So let me, for, to finish, give an overview of the uh, various COVID-19 reactions we have at the level of the EU institution. So the Commission, and it was already said by uh, Stankam, um, is, is, is advocates financial support for the agri uh, food sector and fisheries with right now no green strategy behind it. A big issue for the Commission, and it was also already mentioned by the Olivier, does um, not seem to be willing to stop overproduction, but it advocates private storage measures and also financing them, which is not really also um, solving the problem because it's still on the market uh, then later on and the, the prices are going still to fall. Uh, so one positive news here is that the Commissioner for Agriculture, Wojciechowski, is starting to publicly acknowledge the benefits of shorter and more sustainable food chains. So that's a good point. But the EPP, so the Conservatives, and parts of the new the Liberals, so the political party is more on the right, they keep saying how resilient uh, the European food system has proven to be, but at the same time, they ask to postpone the Green Deal and the farm to fork strategy. They want to have more budget, even outside the common agriculture policy for crisis striking farmers, they want to use a reserve, that is 400 million uh, crisis reserve, and this should be activated, they said. And now they are, of course, also saying we need more relaxed rules for farmers, including also more relaxed uh, environmental standards. And I'm, I'm sad to say, but Portugal seems to be in the same position, and I'm afraid that now other member states might, might, might follow in that direction. But for the Greens, and I say it clearly, it's a huge opportunity for change, now or never, to reorientate our food relevant policies and to make them align with our environmental ambitions and goals. So we have a recovery plan, which I invite you to, to check. But food production, and it was already said today, must be resourced local at a local level without needing to import massive feed from overseas. And uh, also the large majority, and I really think that the large majority, and it was said by Sanka too, of the citizens stand behind these ideas. They want healthy food and more well-being for animals, which was also proven by the European Citizen Initiative signed by more than half um, a million and a half people and the cage age. So people want also well-being for animals. They want healthy food. They want us to fight the loss of biodiversity and to fight climate change. So our targets are clear. No postponement, please, of the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy a comprehensive assessment of the common agriculture policy and the common fishery policy, considering also all of the costs, the externalities due to destroying our natural resources or polluting the environment, and of the proposed policies, and we need an adjustment. Of course, what we Greens really want is a paradigm shift in this whole agriculture policy, moving from a hectare-based subsidies, a quantity, approach to a more quality-based approach, allowing the farmers to live with dignity and contributing to the sovereignty, sovereignty of our food system and the protection of the environment. To conclude, please let me highlight that this crisis is also a result how we treat our resources, how we treat our land, how we treat animals, where we, where we share the planet with. So I hope I really hope that we are all learning from this crisis and making the right conclusions for the next generations. We can only ensure food security if we learn to respect and to work within our planetary and regional natural boundaries. And this will only be pos possible in a participative approach with the farmers by giving them new opportunities to work in order to maintain and restore our common goods. I hope I'm still in 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you for listening.
Well, Tilly, thank you very much for this really uh, clear analysis of the current state of affairs at the level of the European policy and how the Greens uh, look upon it. And I'm very happy that, uh, meanwhile, we, we already have several questions coming in. And I would invite the people that are posing questions to write from which country you are, so we can also share how many people from different countries are in this dialogue. I have a first question for Olivier asking, uh, has a question on how should we tackle the issue of food waste as a big share of harvests are still destroyed before it comes to the market or before we can uh, eat it. So how to deal with the issue of food waste? Thank you for the question. I think it's a very important uh, aspect of the general discussion. We have, as, as T.D. Metz was saying, we have emphasized for many years, in fact, since the start of the Common Agricultural Policy, the need to increase production in order to make sure that we um, keep prices affordable uh, for the end consumer. Um, and we um, today hear many calls in times of resource scarcity that we need to develop new technologies, including GMOs, in order to um, increase the level of production to keep up with demographic growth and changing demand. But we do not act sufficiently on this huge question of food waste. And globally, but the figures are similar for Europe, we waste about 30% of the food that is produced. Now, of course, in developing countries, the, the waste takes place primarily at the farm level because of a poor logistics and no uh, facility to store the food in right conditions. In Europe, it's um, primarily a problem of food being processed in uh, the agri-food industry chains, um, with many um, lots of food being uh, being uh, uh, wasted at that end and and at the at the end of the of the consumer um, uh, on supermarket shelves and and so on. Uh, and and it is a, a significant uh, issue given the resources it takes to produce all this food that is wasted. Now. One approach that has been favored in many countries to address this is to encourage supermarket chains to negotiate with charities, NGOs, providing food aid to families in need in order to make sure that the unsold food items, those that the supermarkets have not sold on time, uh, can be provided to these, um, to these families in need. And there is even a law adopted in France on this uh, initially in 2016 and then revised in, in 2019. In other countries, it's um, local um, um, municipalities that uh, make um, the opening of new supermarkets conditional upon such agreements being found with NGOs. The problem with this approach is that it describes food aid as a permanent solution to food insecurity for families in need, which I think is not acceptable. We should not see food aid as a substitute for robust social protection schemes. And more importantly, it does not discourage the supermarkets, the large retailers, from managing the food stocks and the flows in a more efficient manner. So overproduction is not even addressed as an issue. And instead of um, supermarkets being sanctioned for having too many items that remain unsold, um, supermarkets, in fact, are um, helped to get rid of their surpluses by these charities stepping in to take these surpluses from the, from the shelves of supermarkets and delivering them to families in need. So I believe we need um, a, a much more um, robust approach to this issue by taxing food waste, in other terms, by ensuring that supermarkets who have not man managed well their food stocks um, shall have to pay in order to compensate for the damage caused, uh, the resources mis misused, if you wish. And, um, and, and that is the, the best way to, to avoid um, overproduction and, and, the, and the mismanagement of flows. Um, and, and finally, I think we need to educate the public much better about the indications we find on, on foods that are sold in supermarkets concerning the, 
the sell-by dates and the best before dates. I think there are many misunderstandings concerning this and that um, all too often um, um, simply providing better information to the consumer and, and ensuring that the families act more responsibly in this regard can make a significant difference. Thank you. Okay, thank you for this answer. I think indeed if one third of our food is wasted, this is a big amount and, and tackling this issue will solve quite some problems already. I have a second question I, for Stanka, which I think is quite interesting. It's around the concept of suit sovereignty. Uh, someone writes, it's a tricky concept in times of crisis, isn't it? Because it may invoke that uh, because of food sovereignty, uh, nations maybe will close the border with creating food shortages in other countries. So, how do you react to this uh, question? Thanks for that question. Um, so, the concept, Friends of the Earth, one of the organizations together with Via Campesina, who is supporting the concept of food as the right of people um, to have access to affordable and, and healthy food. So when we talk about food sovereignty, we're not necessarily talking about uh, closing uh, border, having any trade at all. This is not at all what we mean with, uh, with, with the concept of food sovereignty. What we mean with it is really giving the opportunity uh, to um, to regions, to um, locations, to countries, to be able to decide what and, and how um, they are going to produce. So obviously this um, has been maybe used now from, uh, from people to describe what um, to close borders and to um, not, um, not allow any and so on. This, this is not what we mean. I think um, what I read in the, I don't know if Olivia mentioned this now, but um, in several papers we saw obviously now in this crisis to close the borders would mean that a lot of people will uh, be not able to, uh, to have access to food. So on the short term, uh, especially now, it's actually important to keep the, uh, the, the food flow, the, the trade um, still going but on the longer term, work towards what um, I think also Tilly described towards a different system where uh, we will not need to at all uh, think about these problems because uh, we, we will have a different production where the needs of, of certain uh, location of um, certain region is being are being covered by the production which is there. I hope that answers. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We have a next question for Tilly concerning the agroecological farmers community. The person who has the question says that it seems that these agroecological farmers are less present in the debate. How come they are not really influencing what's on the political agenda? What's their position in terms of concrete ideas and proposals? Yes. So. What is very important indeed, and I, I mentioned it in, in, in my presentation, it's really to have a participatory, a participative uh, approach so that people, different people and different experts and different people also from the terrain, from the ground, who are really experiencing also what it means uh, to have to practice the agro ecology or the organic farming and uh, that they can show as Olivier de Schutter was also saying that they are even more productive and that they create job, jobs and which for me is very important too if you make an um, uh, it's a few years old but I was there they were asking the farmers if they were satisfied with their life, with their work. And there is really a big difference between the organic farmers and the others who are much more happy with what they do, who feel more recognized by the society. And I think it's very important to have different farmers, conventional and also the one from the agroecology around one table so that they can exchange best practices and that we can contribute to give somehow 
back their, their dignity also to the farmers because they feel now, okay, now we are the guilty ones also from the climate change, etc., for the loss of biodiversity, but they also also part of the solution. So I think it's very important that uh, we have the different farmers around the table and that we have really um, uh, the farm to fork strategy um, and there is in it that they, uh, there should be really an action plan to more organic farming and there really we have to hear more the voice of all the people from this uh, domain, from the agroecology and the person who said that is completely right. I would like to hear them much more too and that they experience uh, about the positive sides also of this transition from conventional agriculture to more organic agriculture and what it brought them. But of course, it's probably linked with a lot of fears. And especially when you have a common agriculture policy, policy, policy who is really still that the more hectares you have, the more money you get, I say it in a very simplified uh, way, but it's, it's still like that. Even now, the new common agriculture policy, the main pillar is still on that. that so it's very hard for them to 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 make this switch if they don't feel supported by policy by politicians so we really need if we want this ecological transition in our food chain we really have to make also concrete measures to support the farmers and especially give more voice to the ones who made this switch yes okay thanks for this answer yeah. May I add to these two sentences, uh, Dirk? Of course. I, I think what Tilly Metz said is really important. And I'd like to simply add that when in France, uh, when at the time Minister Stéphane Le Foll was in charge of agriculture in the, under the presidency of François Hollande, they adopted a law in 2012 on the future of agriculture, food and forests that sought to uh, encourage agroecology. This was in 2012. And it did not work perfectly well for two reasons. First, because when you switch from conventional farming to agroecology, it takes two or three years before you can uh, actually create a well-functioning, agroecological, diversified farming system. And during that period of time, you may suffer a loss of revenue. So it's important that farmers are protected from that risk and that financial instruments are developed to support them during that transition. In other terms, it cannot be done overnight. And no. secondly, it's important to realize that nothing of significance can happen at the level of production, at the level of the farm, without the other segments of the chain being examined. We need new marketing opportunities. We need schools and, and, and in general, um, public catering services to source from these farmers practicing agroecology. We need short food circuits to be developed in order to give them opportunities to sell their produce, which the big players, the big agri-food companies are not interested in buying. And so there are a number of conditions to the switch to agroecology that go beyond just the level of production. Thank you. Okay, there was a question uh, which comes closely to this, so I will put it on the table. It's the question on which transition we envisage for commercial catering and corporate food supplies, as these are the most affected by the lockdown. And how can we support them to switch to more local and seasonal supplies? So, I know who, maybe Olivier, you can continue on this question. No, I, I think it's an important point. Um, there is a, a clearly a change in the expectations of the public. Um, just 15 years ago, people were most interested in having access to cheap food without much attention being paid to the, to the quality of the food and, and to the, um, the nutritious uh, qualities in particular. Now, they care about the environmental impacts, they care about the rights of farm workers, and they care, of course, about where the food comes from. The problem is they don't always have this information. And the, there is a proliferation of labels um, that makes it very difficult for consumers to express their preferences well in Tiralia when they go to, to, to restaurants uh, and, and so on. So I think what we really need to do is to um, 
um, develop tools that can allow the um, food catering industry that sources from local farmers and that prioritizes farmers who, who produce organic food or, or food produced according to agroecological methods to be rewarded by, by the end eater. And I think also it's important in, in many countries, schools are trying to shift, for example, to local organic farmers, and they meet two problems. One, the legal framework on public procurement, public contracts, is still not allowing to prioritize local food producers. There are a number of flexibilities allowed to public collectivities, but not uh, to prioritize local producers. And I think there is a mismatch between the the legal framework adopted at EU level and what local, local entities wish to do. The second problem is sometimes um, there is more demand for local and organic stuff and, and too little supply. Farmers are unable to, 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 to switch on time to match this increased demand. So we need perhaps to have a transition and to, and to have schools and, and public administrations um, first source maybe 30 percent from organic uh, farmers and then move to you know 50 percent in two years and then 60 percent in five years etc we need to do this gradually in order to allow production and consumption to adapt gradually to this transition we're calling for okay thanks uh, stanka i have a question uh, for you you spoke in your introduction between the different realities of the urban and the rural uh, people in the urban being at their houses and farmers working very hard. There's also a growing interest in what is called urban agriculture. You think this can be part of the new agricultural system or is it more just something recreational? I definitely think that um, urban agriculture can be part of the, the transition and not only in the city itself, in the periphery um i think when we talked about uh, food waste and 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 making food chains much shorter it's an important aspect to think about uh, really feeding the city from uh, what it can produce itself and also what it uh, the farmers around are producing so there's so many different examples i'm part of a food cooperative which um here in, in skarbek which gets uh, products from a farmer just 10 kilometers away um we have several urban gardens here in in brussels as well where people also meet the city of brussels has a a, a good food plan which actually brings together all aspects together not only the, the gardening but um also uh, what is in some of the canteens different projects that are brought around and i think um several other cities are doing this as well so definitely um bringing cities to act on this, it's its a very important part of the whole action. And since we are finishing, I just want to, uh, talking about action, um, to call to everyone to um, be active if they're interested in this issue. We've been working on this uh, since years and we have created the Good Food, Good Farming campaign, which is ongoing and is trying to change uh, the food system. So if, if that got your interest or if you're interested already, we are planning an action starting on the 12th of, 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 um, of May, asking people to act towards the European Parliament um, to change the cup reform and that um, has been just talked about. So um, again, call to action. Um, yeah. Spread the word. Don't uh, be silent. If if I may just add, uh, and then... I, I was. I just yes. wanted to say that uh, we are almost finishing, but I really would allow all three of you to have this kind of final message. What's your top priority? What really we have to? How we should use this crisis, this momentum now, to make this change happening? So Tilly, please go ahead. <laughs> no, I just wanted to add well to what Stanka was saying, that it's very important for the politicians that we have these NGOs, that we have the citizens, that we have the, the scientists who, who support now with actions, with uh, making them hurt, like we do this afternoon, for that we have this real change, because 
we have in future, if we want to avoid pandemics, if we want to fight the loss of biodiversity and of climate change, we also need this ecological transition in agriculture. And this goes not by politicians. This needs the support of everybody, of the farmers, of the citizens. It's uh, like Olivier said, it's at every level that somebody can do something in order to have this ecological transition in agriculture. Thank you. Okay, please, uh, Olivier, what's for you the priority number one? The mic, the mic. Thank you. This is a unique moment for European integration. The amount of money that is going to be poured, that is being poured into the economy by governments is entirely unprecedented in, in, in times of peace. Uh, at least 4,000 billion euros um, will be um, injected into the economy to support uh, uh, businesses. And it's really important that this money uh, goes to the ecological transition and that we do not see economic reconstruction first and then environmental considerations to come later because they would be of minor importance. So let us really uh, be very attentive to what shall happen in the next two weeks because it's now that the next 10, 15 years um, economic landscape shall be decided. Thank you. Okay, and as Tilly said, uh, the most vibrant part of our democracy is civil society. So I also want to give the last word to Stanka, to what maybe also from a personal point of view, what would be your priority number one? Um, I said already, well, um, again, an invitation to action. Um, very important that everyone who can engage at the moment engages in solidarity because again that's a it's a it's a problem for all of us and and we need to really act in solidarity uh, to solve this problem all together otherwise it will come back and it will be even harder than this time so thanks a lot for listening and being part of this discussion okay many thanks i know one hour is quite short to have three people but they're all three were very concise. So I want to thank you all three for this great talk. There were many points discussed uh, on the civil society level, the political level, in different countries. And so for people watching us, if you appreciate these talks, please also uh, see whether you could make a donation because small the information is now put in the chat will be really very good. And of course, we will proceed with these green talks and next week, we will talk about the future of work and the week after probably about the future of mobility. So many time, many thanks for watching us and I would say stay safe and have a nice uh, rest of the day. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. Bye.